this year is to work with at-risk youth, to work with people who hopefully will not end up here if we share this kind of Shakespeare work uh, and acting work and autobiographical work with them. So we are hopefully going to be starting a program in the fall at the middle school, which is a school for kids um, who are on probation or who have been expelled from other schools. And we're going to use what we've learned working with you guys to create a program uh, to work with kids. So we thought that this video could be aimed uh, at kids. You know, why do kids act up? And what might you guys, with the benefit of your experience, what would you say to kids today? Or what would you say to yourself? What do you wish you knew as a kid? And that's kind of, that's, we thought that would be the focus of what we talk about today. Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. This is a chance for you guys to do one more really great and beneficial thing in your life. You know this film is going to be dedicated to teenagers and to really understanding um, you know, how we can help teens to move forward in the world and live from their highest potential. Um, and it's also, in my mind, uh, an opportunity for us to look inside our own past and how we've healed from any woundings we might have all experienced in the past. I always like the saying, um, you know, when we haven't healed the past, we inevitably carry it into the present. Yo no tengo como un deseo de estar en la cámara desde cuando. Si puedo ayudar a los niños, yo sé cómo es. Pregúntame cosas y yo te lo contesto. All right. I had a dog. And I, I never showed that dog love because I, I didn't know what it, love was. I had a dog. His name was Kilo. I didn't know how to show Kilo love. Well, I'm glad I had a dog, you know. What well, dog want to show me love? Well, <laughs> I didn't know how to show him love, you know. I'm like, get away from me, get away from me. One day, my girlfriend told me, came home, I came home and my Kilo was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Kilo said, no love here. <laughs> 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 Kilo, so she let Kilo go for what she said. I let Kilo go for what? I'm still looking for Kilo. Truth of the matter, though, I didn't show the dog love because I didn't have love. That's basically what I'm trying to generate. So show your kids love and let them know you're there for them and they ain't got to look for the street for love. And You know what I mean? You ain't got to buy them all this clothes or goodies or joy and all that. Kids don't need that. They just need your time. So a lot of times it's just paying attention to a person just listening to them, even if they're saying things that you necessarily don't want to hear at certain times, just letting them know that they can be listened and will be listened to. That's, that's big. That's big. Um, you know, just if I'd have been, if somebody would have looked at me and seen that, okay, he's always quiet or, you know, just seen like, just paid attention to me and not left me to myself or to my peers who was going through the same thing. Direction. You know, uh, like uh, Maverick was saying, you know, if he was there to show me the right way, I probably would have followed. Who knows? I could have been a ping pong champion or something. A lot of parents out there today, they so busy with work and, 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 and trying to uh, provide for their family and stuff when they don't even take into context that I'm not providing for them that time, that, that nurturing that they really need. And, you know, as a kid, that's all I really ever wanted was for my parents to, 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 to push me, to be like, hey, you want to play basketball? We're going we gonna, we gonna to cultivate that. Uh, uh, where do you want to go? Why do you want to do this? Because it was always, I, I would come, I want to play football. No, you ain't got time. You got to come watch it. So when you push your kids' uh, uh, desires out and all, you, it's kind of like you, you, you dimming them, you stepping on your, your, their chance to grow instead of nurturing them. Any place that was away from those people, I would have taken them out of that environment and put them over here and just let him be him. Allow him to just be who he was. Let him be an individual, uh, support, 
love, I guess. Uh, you know, just um, encouragement to do the things that he found enjoyable. Any adult, whether you have kids or not, mentor somebody. Because if you don't, the kid down the street that you know is struggling, he's going to be one robbing your house. I left at an early age. Um, I'm a Taurus and I'm bullheaded. I didn't like to listen to my mother rules, so I felt like I should live by my own rules. And if I was going to live by my own rules, it wasn't going to be in her house. So me being out at a young age in hotel living and whenever I can, sleeping at a friend's house or another female's house or just bouncing from place to place and still managing to go to school, was, it was difficult. But I was reckless because money wasn't an issue for me and I was doing above and beyond what I was supposed to be doing. I thought I was invincible. My dad and my best friend, who was more of a dad to me than my dad was, which they both got killed on the same day. He was a big inspiration to me. And I was angry at my father. Uh, because he wasn't there like I wanted him to be. And my friend taught me so much. I mean, it, it, a lot of things he taught me wasn't positive, but he taught me the right way, how to do it, because I was going to do it anyway. And he did do a lot of positive things for the whole neighborhood. My teenage years was horrible. It was kind of rough because, like I said, my father was on the drugs, and then my older brother was you know, selling drugs, so I'm looking at you know, I'm looking up to my older brother, and I'm looking at Pops like, you know, man, you don't take me to football, nothing, you don't, right? And then when I come to you with problems or, you know, hey, help me with this, it's, it's like I don't matter. So, you know, the sense of, like, family and all that, I kind of don't, it's kind of foreign to me, like, you know, this family structure and all that, because I don't come from that. I found myself in a lot of violence. I found myself uh, losing people very close to me. I found myself hurt, life support, uh, hospitals, in and out, visiting people in prison and jail, and all so fast that I wasn't even able to step away from it. It was happening too fast to get out of the car. It's, it's just, it wasn't possible. It's, it's hard for me because the day I was, uh, the day I took my time, it was my, I'll never forget, July 18th, it's my sister's birthday, and my little brother was murdered due to, uh, to gang violence. And um, Alcus Mallory, I miss you, I love you. Uh, and I, I really believe that When, when I was taken out of my home and uh, my co-defendants, we were all together. Where we were all, I have five crimes. Uh, we, once we were all taken, Al was uh, was alone. Al just didn't have nobody. He uh, he got one older sister and two younger. So all Al knew was what we was doing. And Al's interest isn't that. He's in the comic books. He's in the basketball. And once I was gone, once I wasn't driving him to the, to the park, once I wasn't taking him to the school or taking him with me and Tyrone, and once we, it wasn't no longer us, it was just Al. And his interest went down the drain. And it was, he's started hanging around with, you know, the wrong people. And, he found himself in the same situations I was in. He just wasn't as lucky. Like I said, I came to prison as a teenager. And uh, before coming to prison, my teenage years were, I dealt with working and paying bills and living alone. And 
I did everything so fast that it catapulted me out of, out of my teenage years into an adult situation that I really wasn't ready for, that I didn't expect to happen. Um, I took, you know, working and hustling and money and freedom, and I just, all gas, no brakes. And uh, I didn't realize that living the adult life that I felt I was ready for came with a lot of consequences that I wasn't able to actually fathom. Uh, me and all my friends and, you know, my brothers, we all had this motto, you know, high risk, high reward. It's that get you going and so you can do it, but we never actually contemplated the, the risk. I, I expected to come to prison. You know, my, I got family all through, uh, all through the state. I got cousins coming in now. I got an uncle over in West Block. Um, a couple years ago, I left one prison and uncle died there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the life as far as I knew it. I remember when everything changed at 12 years old, there was just that instance. That, I remember that whole instance, like, you know, I just said, fuck it, I hate life. I don't want to live anymore and I don't want anybody around me. And I'm just going to try to destroy everything around me. I can remember it clearly. And I was like, because I felt like the whole world was against me. There was nobody on my side. So I had to be on my side. I got tired of fighting for people who didn't, didn't want to fight alongside me. So I, I became a heartless. I, I had no feelings. I had no, no sympathy. I lived in apathy. I didn't care. You, I was in a point in my life where I could watch something heinous happen to somebody and well, that's, they had that coming in some way because that's the way it was explained to me, everything that happened in my life. I always had it coming. I live on the street, hang out on the street, you know, when I uh, hang out with tourists because I, you know, I thought they care about me because the tourists that come to Belize is who I hang around because they show me they care. And uh, when they, I'll go to the restaurant and eat their leftovers and stuff like that, drink the rest of their beer, smoke a cigarette. I was a kid, you know. I just want to survive. I just want to be accepted. I just want to be loved. And I'm just living on the street, so I thought the street was my mother and father. And that's why I was learning everything I was learning. Because I didn't, you know, every, when I was at home, I got abused, got hurt. And I just wanted to run and just kept running. Just wanted to find an escape. What was your escape? Drinking, smoking, just whatever, you know. What made me violent was the bullying, you know. Because I was being bullied as a kid, being teased, being hit, couldn't defend myself. Then I, you know, then I came to America. And I was being bullied because I was a foreigner in, you know, dealing with those name calling. Go back to your country. And one day a friend of mine told me, you got you to start protecting yourself. And he took me to his uncle. And he told me that his uncle no martial arts, that he, you know, he could teach me. And I, and I vouched ever since. His uncle told me, said to us that you can't beat up everybody in the world without making sure they know you was there. And I, I remember that today. And he said um, that, uh, and you, you know, you got to protect yourself. You can't just let nobody take advantage of you like that. And I vouch ever since then that I'm not going to let nobody bully me at all. They're going to pay dearly. Because at one, one time I was just taking it and taking it, and I couldn't take it no more. And I kind of find out I become the bully. For me, it was really, really fun. In fact, uh, I had too much fun. I overdid it. I, uh, as soon as I got my license, it was just uh, gone all day, night. Uh, I mean, it was just, it was just crazy. It was fun, um, and uh, led me to uh, a lot of uh, destructive things, uh, a lot of destructive people.
I'm free. I had. I thought I was free. I thought I was an, an adult. You know, I would go to clubs and, and the pool hall, hang out, um, stay out all night, come back home. And although I had to juggle going to school, uh, I thought I could handle it. I thought I could, could manage it. Um, and then everybody who I hung around with was a, were, were accepting. And, and um, you know, we got into drugs, alcohol, and yeah, this is what teenagers do, you know. Because of who I was and the way I was, I was really arrogant and selfish, and everything was about me. And that thinking resulted in me hurting myself, my family, um, not taking responsibility for my kids, my wife. Um, there were people in my family that passed away, and I was too busy to be there. My solution to the problem of not being able to socialize because I wasn't like people my age was to get better. That was better than everybody. That was my solution. My teenage years were, we moved around a lot. Um, me and my mother, we were very, very poor. We lived in like, at one point, like in a car, in a tent. And it was really, really bad. But my mom was always, she always kept a hold of me. She didn't like ditch me off anywhere. So. We lived up in the mountains for a particular point in time. My father had committed suicide, and I had uh, Adam went through health troubles. I had cancer and stuff, so it was really, really crazy. And so, at a particular point, my mom was like really going through her own issues, and I ended up moving out, moved to Southern California, lived with my brother, and I was on my own. You know, I was just doing my thing at about 14. You know, I had people around me that were like supportive. I, I used to go to a church, I used to go to a Mennonite church. It's kind of crazy. Certain people that like pick me up and... There were people that would reach out, but I was really... I was stagnating. You know, like I just didn't, I didn't see the benefit in doing school, trying to get good grades. At one point I had a point, point one four grade point average. That's all F's with a D minus. <laughs> I do the math. I remember it was a point one four in high school, and it got me out of wrestling. You know, I was a I was a vicious wrestler. I was undefeated for like three years, and got me kicked out of wrestling. I couldn't do any other sports, and you know, staying on top of grades and taking school serious, and the people around you that are reaching out, because people will throw you away. I've been locked up since I was sixteen. My teenage years were uh, very busy doing everything I could uh, to act as if everything was all right. Uh, I was uh, kind of, I wasn't bipolar, I had two characters. Okay, one character was uh, very depressive and another character uh, acted as if everything was okay. And uh, I did a lot of self-medication a lot of smoking grass. Uh, if I couldn't smoke grass, I'd get alcohol. There was some uh, childhood trauma when I was uh, very young, and that was like the beginning. And uh, the, the household was chaotic. My parents were not alcoholics, but they were, they were functioning uh, alcohol drinkers, abusers, okay? Uh, and it was, it was kind of scary, okay? There was, there was a lot of fear. And uh, it, it, it was definitely painful in a way that uh, it, it, it just went instantly into my subconscious because I didn't have the strength of the empowerment to deal with it when I was a, a four, five, six year old growing up. Uh, I had a lot of siblings. I had uh, three older siblings and, and one younger sibling. And for me, uh, what I learned from them was how to be a better liar. And my teenage years were, they were okay. They were uh, rough at some times, but they were all right. I was the oldest male in the family, so I would take on a lot of, just trying to take care of my family, work, school, 
you know. I got it both ways, I, I, I joke around, you know. I either got it because, you know, black, you know, African American or Jewish. So I was gonna catch one or the other. And uh, I caught a lot. I was raised up in Marin. I was like uh, the poor kid living in a rich environment. And so that didn't exactly, uh, that, that was unusual to say the least. Uh, um, my childhood was based on uh, mostly fear, low self-esteem. Um, uh, you know, and through those, and, and a lot of violence. Well, it's all, it was all pretty much fear-based. And I remember as a little kid, seven, eight years old, self-medicating before I even knew what addiction was or anything else. Sniffing glue, lighter fluid, uh, those kind of things. And, uh, and what it was is just I did not like that I had no control over my life at all. So I had to try to find a way to feel differently so I wouldn't have to feel the stress and the fear that I felt as a kid. Um, you know, welfare, food stamps. It's interesting because as a little kid, uh, I used to be sent down to the liquor store with a note from the stepdad to get cigarettes and, and, uh, and at times six packs of beer because we were known in the neighborhood, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't steal from pops, you know, you just go do what you're told. But I remember the first time I felt shame and uh, was, going to the store at 12, and uh, having the food stamps, and, and purchasing something with the food stamps, and having people look at me like it was a piece of crap. And I think that's the one only time I felt shame. Um, I can't honestly say that I felt guilt, because everybody in my family, stepdad, everybody was surviving, everybody was on survival mode. And everybody was getting high. We had a lot of Vietnam vets coming back. And, and uh, it was all about just getting high and just trying to just survive one day at a time. And, and I never liked bullies, uh, even though I got in a lot of trouble uh, at elementary school, because I felt that the abuse I was suffering at home, I wasn't going to accept it outside of the home. You know, so I could say some of the positive things I learned was I learned that being a bully was not good. That wasn't a choice that I wanted to to uh, endure, or not, or, you know, to follow. Um, hitting women, because I saw my mom being beat constantly, so I, I never wanted to do that. Uh, but what I did learn from my stepdad was how to manipulate, how to intimidate, how to lie. I, I became an awesome liar. I remember loving that show, uh, Courtship of Eddie's Father. I'm not sure. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know why. It was the relationship. It was the fact that Eddie could screw up and his dad would still love him. You know, um, instead of being called every name in the book, knocked around, you worthless, this and that, and the next thing. I used to not go to school and I used to run away and they used to throw you in juvie for that. So I loved juvie because I had like halfway normal people helping me. But it just wasn't enough because I was put back in that environment. For me, they were, uh, they were wonderful. I mean, I lived on my own from 13 until I was about 19. Even now, in retrospect, I missed a lot of things. I didn't get to be a kid for a long time because I had already been working for a year. You're 13 years old, you're working, you're going to school. It's not like you're enjoying childhood. You're not going out and hanging with the buddies. You're not playing in the front yard. You're not doing any of the things that kids that age do you're doing stuff that maybe you'd be doing five, 10 years ahead of time. The downside was I had started smoking pot when I was about 11. So it made it easier to continue experimenting and doing things. And I didn't like narcotics, so that wasn't a big deal, but I did smoke pot constantly. So when you don't have those uh, buffers in place, when I was at home, it was like, okay, you got parents. You come home, it's like, okay, I can't be bombed out. So it was a break. There was, there was, there was that thing there that stopped you from going or for, from overindulging. 
I was raised with both parents. Uh, I had a good upbringing. I didn't think so at the time because I had a lot of restrictions. My mother went to church, so it was a lot of church stuff. And, uh, but I learned a lot in that church. I acquired a lot of skills from my mother that I used in a bad way. What was hard for me was because of the church that we went to, we didn't celebrate Christmas. We didn't celebrate any holidays. So all the other kids celebrated all the holidays. So now um, us not having any money became more of an issue because people thought that we didn't celebrate Christmas because we didn't have any money. Feeling um, invisible because I was always around so many people and I never felt like anybody paid attention to me. Um, the church I went to, there was always lots of kids. Um, the families that we associated with, there were lots of people, and I was always just one of the kids, and I felt like I should have been the kid. Kids, kids are, are a product of their adults, you know? Uh, and when I was growing up, I was the redhead stepchild. I was in the middle, you know? So my job was to watch my little brothers and I was, I was really, I was there, but I was never there. And I, my, my parents never picked up on me. The things that I wanted to do was never important. So most of my, uh, my childhood life, I was in the house, babysitting my, my little brothers while all my other friends, they was out living their lives, having fun, their parents taking them here and there. And uh, my brother had left home because we had a stepfather who used to abuse us. He used to smoke crack cocaine and just get violent with us for no reason. And he left. And when he came back, he was, uh, he was murdered in Richmond. And that affected me because like my older brother was like my father figure. And after that, I pretty much said screw the world and everything in it. And I turned to, you know, people who actually took me in. And it happened to be uh, the Asian community and my, my, my friends who happened to be gang members. And their focus on me let me know that, you know, you are important, you know, and it's, 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 it may sound funny, but gangs have that, that way of giving a kid what he needs, you know, they, they, uh, they give you, well, I'm not going to say it's positive reassurance, but they do reassure you that, you know, you, you part of the crew, you important to us and anything that happened to you, well, we going to have, uh, we going to, we going to have a say in that and you're not alone. And so I gravitated to that. Not only that, but they showed me the life that was glamorized on TV, you know, the nightlife girls, fast cars, drugs, all that. So, because I didn't delve into this until I was 17. You know, I was late, late bloomer. And from 17 to 19, I did it all. And then in 19, that's when I, uh, I committed my crime and I came to jail. So, it was fast lived, but it's real easy for a kid to get caught up in that, especially if they don't get what they need to get from their their parents from at home. They'll go outside looking for it. And that's what I did. Look for positive people that's around you because the world is big and there's a lot of positive people around you that's willing to help you, but you gotta swallow your pride and ask for help. You just gotta actually ask for help, right? Because the world is too big to take on by yourself. Everybody needs somebody. So just ask for help, love yourself and you know, teachers, um, you know, mentors, right? A uncle, an auntie, somebody that is doing the right thing, you know, in your life. Just ask for help. Tell them what you're going through and just ask for help. And that will prevent you from feeling like you got to take on the world by yourself, right? Because can't nobody take on the world by themselves, whether you're young or old, right? Everybody needs somebody. So just ask for help. Understand you're never alone. You are always connected to someone. And everything you would do affects everyone. 
And the road to success is to make it about them, not about you. Because when you start making things about others and not yourself, everything you need will come to you. The right role model in terms of uh, empowering myself. I mean, they, they were out there, but I, th I think I was in too much pain. So uh, if, if, I, if I'd have known what I just related, you know, to find somebody who will listen, okay, th that would have uh, done the trick. My father and mother, grandfather, grandmother, never gave me and my brothers bad advice. So the question I would answer to myself is listen to those around you and trust their guidance. And the decisions you make, try to make the best decisions that you can because you don't want to be in this seat, in this arena, ever. It sucks, period. Be willing. The biggest tool is willingness to look at everything and then to address those issues. You can't fix something if you don't, if you don't address it, bottom line. And as painful as it may be, uh, I'm just not into living into the denial thing. I'm not, I, you know, I want to be my authentic self, and the only way I can do that is to be honest with myself. You know what I mean? That's why I don't use drugs. You know, it's not like I'm better than. It has nothing to do with it. It's just that I, want, I can't be authentic and be using drugs at the same time. So I've had to learn, I've had to have the willingness to learn different ways to deal with life on life's terms. And and then to put it into practice, to make it a skill set. I'm not perfect. My problem was, one of my triggers is that when things aren't going my way, when things get really stressful for me, I can revert back to old behavior. That was my MO for many, many years, even through marriage, through jobs. I've had good jobs, I've had good work ethic, um, but when the going gets tough, Joey reverts back to old behavior. I have a, a life sentence. And I've been locked up since that age, you know, since I was a teenager. So there's people that are more than willing, if you do the wrong, you know, in my case, an innocent man was killed. So if you are in that predicament, and there's some way that people are reaching out to you to avoid situations like that, take them. Because that's, uh, I think that's where I missed. You know, I don't think as a teenager, you really understand the gravity that people will look at you as something that's, you know, tossable, we can just throw you away. Uh, being more open-hearted to other, others' feelings. Uh, I, I used to uh, just care about myself, you know. It was all about I, give all the vows back. I felt it was all about me. Sometimes I still do, but in a good way, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, but yeah, uh, be more uh, open, care about other people's feelings, being more compassionate, and just, uh, you know, helping people get through their day the best I can when I'm having a good day or when I'm not having a good day to make somebody else smile. You can be the kid, the kid, but not all the time. You have to share that with other people. You're not in this world alone. So everything that you want, other people want too. And so you have to share that. So that's what I've learned, just to share and to let other people get the spotlight and enjoy it when they get it, instead of like, okay, hurry up, get your turn, are you done? So I can get back, so. Actually understand and believe that it's okay to be you. For as far as I've known, every single person that I've ever met in prison, the thing that they love most isn't in prison. It's dancing and making music and art and poetry. And, and I believe if we were, when we, had, when we were younger, at a place to where we can say, I'm going to find people who like to dance. I like music. I, I do music. I do fashion. I do, uh, I'm, I'm in art. If I were to surround myself with, people that also did that, there would be no need for violence. You know, um, if I always surrounded myself with people who had the same passions in their heart that I had in mine, I wouldn't carry a pistol. 
I would say life is what you make it. Uh, it's going to be a roller coaster, up and down. But uh, it's not what you do when you get knocked down. It's what you do when you get back up. You know, so, uh, you know, it's not the end of the world. You know, it's still time to make your wrongs right. To, to believe in yourself, you know, to believe in yourself and, and to be patient. What you want will come with a little hard work and a little motivation. So, man, I would have told him, keep, keep, keep keeping on, man. Even though it's rough right now, it's going to get brighter. I came to prison, and I was tired. My face hurt, and my knuckles hurt, and I was just hopeless. I mean, I wanted, I really wanted to die, but I didn't, I didn't want to kill myself because that seemed too easy. I wanted to go out with a bang, but I was in a, confined to an area where I couldn't do that. So I really just got on my knees and just started crying to God, you know, kill me, let me die. I, I, I'm tired of living. I don't want my life. I don't want anything. Um, just please just let it end. And, uh, you know, that night God reached down and touched me and he put this feeling in me that I... I still struggle with feelings, uh, happiness, sadness, uh, joy. Uh, knowing that he loves me is one of the weirdest things in the world to me even today because my parents didn't love me. They, they, they may love me, but none of their actions ever showed that they love me. Let's put it that way. I'm sure they do. Uh, so from that point on, I, I just made a point. I'm not going to put my hand on another person. I'm not going to... Uh, tear anybody down. I'm not going to be devious, manipulative. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. <sighs> Coming to San Quentin really when I begin to feel a lot of empathy and compassion from people at San Quentin because other prisons I've been to like Corcoran, Tashby, you know, there was no compassion. I didn't know what that was. You know, I just knew how the uh, rough part of prison, you know, about survival, you know, just going to the hole and everything like that, getting caught up in fights, whatever, getting, you know, drinking, getting high, just to survive and to be accepted and to know my pain and hurt that I was feeling, you know. They didn't know how to care for it, they didn't know how to nourish it, you know, and then coming to San Quentin. Uh, they show me a different side of humanity, that there is love. I, I do deserve to be, you know, deserve love. I do deserve compassion, appreciate it. I didn't know what that was. They, that was foreign language to me. And I'm trying now trying to take this love and compassion and empathy, you know, and sympathy and forgiveness and everything towards my past. And that's what I'm trying to direct it to my younger childhood, knowing that they never had that. And my, my younger childhood, you know, was rough. And, my younger self deserved to be loved, deserved compassion, deserved empathy. And I'm giving that to him, but nobody gave it to him. I want to let him know he deserved to be loved. And I was looking for love. Didn't know what love is, you know. I thought love was money. But I could flick pain, because I know what pain is, because I, I was a tornado. I will hurt, and I want you to know my hurt. I want you to understand my pain. I want to understand what I feel, you know. One of the gentlemen was sharing that, but, you know, that's how I was feeling. But today I don't want nobody to feel that because it's not nice. It's not nice. I want them to feel love because I want to feel that. I'm an adventurous person, and, and, and I don't know if you can see it. I'm shaking right now. I uh, have major stress, right? And um, so, but I'm also, I think I'm a strong-willed individual. And so I got, I got to always challenge myself. Uh, and that's why I'm taking college. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, challenge myself in a positive way that wouldn't be so um, hurtful to other people. I looked at other methods of thinking, like I started to study and read the Buddhist sutras, 
and see what you know Buddhism was all about and I started meditating and quieting my mind and finding singularity in my thought and when I shut all this me stuff up a lot of truth exposed itself to me and one of those truths was that I and I alone am the cause of the conditions in my life. I made a commitment because there's nothing I can do about it from today onward except to make a commitment to think the right thing, say the right thing, and do the right thing in everything that I do. So that's like a, a mantra. It's like every day. That's what am I going to do today that's not about me, that helps others, that's about doing the right thing, thinking the right thing, saying the right thing. I, I even stop myself if I begin to think because I realize that thought is a form of energy and by energy it has mass and so even thought has consequences because cause and effect is how the universe is designed, right? So I'm real careful about even be any negative thoughts. I'll stop it, no. And I have this thing that I say to myself, wrong thought, wrong thought, don't do that, wrong thought. What I really believe in is that I really believe that like loving people and like what you people are doing, what I see people come in, this is the closest thing I do with a self-help group. I still don't even do self-help for the board. And uh, I kind of gave up through that means of getting out, you know, because like I said, they'll throw you away. So for a long time, I, I have a little hope now to get out, but I never really had that hope. But the measure of a man to me is like opening up and, and helping people like how you guys do, like loving people. Even though I don't do self-help and whatnot, I don't, I really believe like just helping people and, and showing love, that's where it's at. Uh, being honest with myself and with others, uh, you can, it's, it's a release, okay? It's a release without, without the chemicals. Uh, you, you actually are, are treating yourself when you, when you could, uh, open up, that, that opening up, making myself vulnerable, uh, that, that started a, a lot of my uh, improvement right there, being honest with myself and, and sharing with, with people who uh, had empathy. I never wanted to play the dozens, I wanted to fight. I figured, hey man, let's just get to it because you're not gonna ruin my ear. And, uh, just only a few years back, I've gotten out of that mind frame. One is, there are alternatives, and I do not have the right to put my hands on another human being. If it's not gonna be in a, in a manner to help them, to help them grow and hear, I, I don't have that right. I mean, to show emotion just to be me is, is I'm fine with it. You know, I don't feel shame, I don't feel any, I just feel this is who I am, and, and I'm very passionate about how I feel, so this is, uh, this is all part of the healing. I think the biggest thing is to reach back and talk to the kid that went through so much within myself. For me, to, as a man, to talk to the child that went through so much. Um, because I've never done that. And until someone pointed that out to me, that kid still exists and all of his issues still existed until I went back and, and, and that's still an ongoing process because it, it's something that happens every day it seems like, where I behave in a way that I attribute to when I was a kid that was unresolved. The choices I made were the ones that caused me harm, whether it have been the DUIs, beating people or whatnot. The choices I made, never make excuses for your actions, ever. Someone said earlier, you know, you go to the streets and you know, the people in the streets, they embrace you, you know, and you, but you coming into this negative, this negative environment, a negative lifestyle. Um, and so you forget, you know, or not forget, but you stop doing the things that you did when you was a kid that you liked. You know, I used to play the clarinet, you know, I ain't played that since I got in the streets. So really just getting back to, you know, my authentic self, realizing who I am and then what I want to become, you know what I mean? Um, that's, that's what helps me in drama. 
helps me with that because it forces me to put myself out there. Um, I don't really like to get too close to, I mean, you know, get too close to people, especially in prison, because to me, I think everybody got some kind of hidden agenda, you know, and then I don't know you. But you have to become vulnerable in order to, you know, grow, you know, and heal and stuff. So drama helps me do that by taking on characters, participating in exercises, and just really, you know, being part of a group, you know, like sort of like a family in a way. Not only do it takes me out of prison, but it takes me out of Williams G29412. It takes me out of being a prisoner. It takes me from being Banks, the rapper on the yard. He do this and you know, he, he's the boxer. And it takes me out of that image that I've always been in in every prison that I've been in. And it puts me in a place of just Antoine, just able to help, able to laugh. I get to act. I get to play parts that I've always thought, I wonder what, sometimes I'll sit back and I'll be like, I wonder what my dad would act like in that situation. And I might spin a part of that or uh, my mom or something. Just being able to, to break out of myself and play something completely different lets me explore feelings and, and uh, perspective I never had. And I can do it where everybody else is doing it. So we're kind of like playing off each other. It's a safe place to get outside of myself and just be an idiot. <laughs> it was interesting that I had to play a woman role. Because, you know, I was a person that they had no respect for a woman. Because uh, <laughs> the way I see how my mother acted. So I didn't, you know, I couldn't tell how I feel. So nobody had no respect for me either, no love for me. And being in a woman dress, I kind of under, uh, understand a little bit what they go through. And we step outside the box of what's the norm, what society thinks of us. I mean, we're worth, we're worth so much. And that's a lot that about Shylock, I think in a way we're all the character of Shylock. We, we're all striving to be better in a community that, that the news says, well, they did this. Every time that there's a play, well, that rapist played that part, or that murderer played that part. Why can't it just be a man who is trying to be better, who did a good job in that part, in an environment that doesn't really promote that? No one wants to live in a closet with a toilet at your head day in, day out, but we do it every day. So when we get out of here, we're gonna be amazing. And you ladies are, are, are the cause of that. You have, you have given us so much strength and so much compassion. We're not gonna be the same men. We can't help but be better. I've got sunshine <coughs> on a cloudy day.